Amen. Thanks, Rex. I like the saxophone. That was sweet. I like it. <clears throat> what a great privilege it is to be here and to, and to take part in the offering that we had. What a, what a great problem it is, isn't it? To have our young people growing. Boy, it's, it's so cool. I love to hear, I, I, I watch the kids run around in the auditorium after church. I like it. Maybe not everybody d- does, but I do. Um, so it, it's a great, and it's a great privilege that the Lord allows us to have a part in His work. Um, so I think I, I, it was really a great time. So, it, like uh, Pastor Carl said, we're going to be in Second Corinthians chapter eight, and we're t- we're going to talk about giving. And when I, I, I first, when the Lord prompted me to do that, I um, I couldn't help but think of a show back in the seventies mid-70s to mid-80s, and it was called Happy Days. Um, I watched it faithfully. I loved Richie and the boys, and, and one of the guys that, that, that hung out with them was Fonzie, Arthur Fonzarelli, the Fonz, and he was the cool one. You know, he had the, the, the boots, the motorcycle boots, and the jeans, the T-shirt, and the leather coat. His hair was always perfect. And they, these guys would go to Fonz and get advice and talk to him. And I remember that most of the time, Fonzie would give them advice, and they, they'd take it, and they'd be happy. But every now and then, Fonzie wasn't correct. They'd say, hey, Fonz, uh, what you told us was wrong. And Fonzie would look at those guys, and he, he'd say, you know, okay, I admit, I was He'd stop and he'd go, no, I was... He couldn't hardly get the word wrong out. And I think that's sometimes how we feel about giving. We think about it and we go, oh, we're going to talk about giving. But, you know, the Lord saved us for a reason, folks. If you have Christ as your Savior, and you're here this morning, you're upright, God has something for you to do, otherwise you'd be dead. We've got a job to do while the Lord leaves us here. And after we get saved, you may have heard it, we're saved to serve. We, we are to give of our time, our talent, and our treasure. We usually talk about the first two T's pretty regularly. Hey, give your time to the Lord. Give your talent, the, 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 the gifts and the talents that the Holy Spirit's given you. Use them for the sake of the Lord. But we don't talk much about treasure. You know, a long time ago, I used to say, it takes three books to run the church. It takes the good book, it takes the hymn book, and it takes the pocket book. Now, a lot, some people, you can still look in front of you, if, if you have it there in front of you, you can see a hymn book. It's not totally foreign to you. But the pocket book's a different thing. That's what my mom used to call a purse. And, and, it, and it takes all three of those books to run the church. But why don't we talk about it much? Why don't we, why are we... We tend to shy away from it. Well, it's because the spiritual charlatans have been using the notion and the concept of giving for personal gain or prestige. They pervert it. They pervert giving of God's people. I remember when we lived in the Springs, we served in, in the, the, the church that we served in. There were some people in our church that used to go to another church in the Springs. And they told me that every now and then they would have this need and they would have what they called paycheck service, paycheck Sunday. And they'd get all the people in their auditorium, they'd lock the back doors, and I'm serious, and they would not let these people go until they got the money that they needed. That's not the type of giving I'm going to talk about. (laughs) I don't think we even have locks for the door, so it wouldn't matter. Now, I talked with a boss, with my manager at the company that I worked for in the Springs, and he was Mormon. And we had a lot of good spiritual, we had a lot of good conversations, because sometimes, a lot of times we were there later in the day and in the evening. And he told me one time, because we were talking about this, he said, Paul, you, you probably don't know this, but he said, at the, at the first of every year, once I get my tax statement, I go into my bishop, the bishop at my ward, and I sit down, he takes my my tax information, he pulls out my giving record, and if they don't match up to 10%, I have to settle right there on the spot. That's not the giving I'm going to be talking about. 
But that's what I'm talking about. And that's where, we're, that's where we're going. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse number 1. But I'm not going to start there because Paul's talking to the Corinthian church in chapters 8 and 9 about giving. But that's not where he started. He, he, he talked to the Corinthians about a year before that. At the end of 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, in chapter 16, the first four verses, he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I have given order to the churches in Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. So Paul told these guys, this church a, a year earlier, he said, he said, this is what you do. You give systematically, you give regularly, and you give according to the way God has prospered you. He said, because I want you to do it upon the first day of the week when you gather to worship, let every man lay, in, lay up for you in store as God has prospered him. Everybody was supposed to give. Everybody was supposed to give in, way, in accordance to the way the Lord prospered them. And he said <clears throat> that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul said, I don't, want to be, I don't want to be coercing you. I don't want to be forcing you. I don't want to browbeat you into giving and take all these last-minute gatherings when I come. I, wanted to, I want you to be ready when I do come. So now, about a year later, Paul's talking to the Corinthians again, and he's encouraging them to follow through on what he asked them to do in 1 Corinthians 16. Because they said, he said, now concerning the gift about giving. Well, they had asked him a question, so he answered it. So now he's encouraging them to follow through with it. He even says in chapter 9, I used your zeal to boast of you to the Macedonians, and in your zeal, your motivation was, was, it, was an inspiration for a lot, of, a lot of churches, a lot of people. And he says, don't make me ashamed of that. Don't make me ashamed that we boasted in you. And when the Macedonians come, they find uh, that you failed. So he's encouraging them to give. But I like it because Paul uses the churches in Macedonia as an example to the Corinthians to help them be encouraged. And in verse 1 of chapter 8, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. <clears throat> The churches in Macedonia, they, were, they, they included Philippi, uh, Thessalonica, and Berea. If you remember in Acts chapter 16, Paul and, and Silas take off on their, they start this, uh, Paul's second missionary journey. They go up into Galatia, and they have every intention of going into Asia and preaching the gospel, and the Holy Spirit says, nope. And they go, okay, well then let's go to Bithynia. So they were going to go up in northern Galatia to Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit stopped them from doing that as well. But in verse 9 of Acts 16, at, during the night, Paul has a vision. And he sees this guy standing in front of him, and he's called the man from Macedonia. And, and this man says, come over into Macedonia and help us. So Paul immediately, the, the next verse says, and when Paul saw the vision, he immediately said, let's go. Let's go. They were up in Troas. They were right on the Aegean Sea on the western side of of uh, current day Turkey, and they needed to go over. Macedonia was in central and northern Greece. And he said, guys, we got to go. I, I know what we're, what, what, what we're to do, and we need to go. And verse number says, says, the group endeavored to go immediately. Why? Because assuredly gathering that the Lord had called them to preach the gospel to them. Paul said, hey, guys, we got to go. We got to preach the gospel to the, to the Macedonians. And obviously they did. You can read through chapter 16 and see what happens to them in Philippi. But these churches in Macedonia had the gospel preached to them. Uh, but Paul says here in, in chapter 8 and verse number 1 that God, the grace of God was bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He, but the, God gave this, these churches the opportunity to, to give, and it was the grace of God that did it. Paul described it as God giving them the opportunity and his merit and his favor to give them the opportunity and privilege of giving. This word grace is the same word for grace in Ephesians 
It's in, and it means goodwill, loving kindness, and favor. It means the merciful kindness of God. And this word grace, the Greek word for grace, is used ten times in chapters 8 and 9. I say the Greek word because a couple times it's not translated grace, it's translated gift, like in verse 4. But Paul equates giving with grace. God's giving us the ability and the opportunity to give. And grace doesn't always, grace doesn't stop at salvation. Oh, sure, we're saved by grace through faith. But once we are saved, God's grace continues to work in us, in our lives. It carries with it. God's grace carries with it a divine influence of the heart reflecting in life. God's grace should be reflected in how we live our lives. Speaking on this verse, Matthew Henry said, The grace of God must be owned as the root and fountain of all the good that is, that is in us or done by us at any time. It is the great grace and favor from God and bestowed on us if we are made useful to others and are forward to any good work. So Matthew Henry says we need to understand that the foundation of all that we do as Christians comes from God's grace, including giving, and that's what Paul's talking about here. Well, how do we see the grace of God in these churches? Paul said so in verse 1. Well, in verse number 2, it says how? That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. You know, I, I took a lot of math in school because um, I was in an engineering program, and I know something about equations. And these equations, this equation doesn't match. A great trial of affliction plus deep poverty plus an abundance of joy equals riches of liberality or generosity. You usually don't put those things together. You usually don't put great trial of affliction and deep poverty equals Oh, extreme generosity. It doesn't usually work that way. But folks, this is, what, this is where God's grace came in. We could see that by combining these, we, we, we see the impact of God's grace in their lives. They took God's grace and ran with it. We don't know what the affliction was. We don't, we, we don't know. It was probably some sort of persecution that a Christian community faced in heathen cities. Whatever the affliction was, though, there was the abundant, they had an abundance of joy and riches that, uh, it, which resulted in their riches of liberality. The Bible says they abounded in it. It means that that word abounded means greater quantity than what is wanted overflow. Their, their liberality, their generosity overflowed from them, and it came from an abundance of joy. I mean, great joy. And, and as I was studying this verse, I realized that the, the, the Greek word for the word abounded in that verse, it, the, the, the Greek word for abundance is the noun form of that verb. So it was like superabundance, overflowing abundance of joy. These people had joy when they gave. As a side note to maybe help you understand this a little better, as I was, as I was looking at that, the Greek word for abundance, there was an additional note from the outline of biblical usage, and it said, <clears throat> this word was used by the Greeks when they wanted to describe the excess wax in one's ears. So if you ever want to understand what kind of joy you should have in giving, it's earwax joy. So you can remember that. It's an abundance of joy. It's an earwax joy. You're welcome. In verse number three, we continue to see their generosity, and then we also pick up on their attitude. We see their opportunity. The church in Jerusalem needed help. We don't know exactly why the church in Jerusalem needed help. There were several factors that it could have been, but they saw the opportunity, and they saw it because of God's grace. Now we see that we continue to see their generosity in verse three, but now we pick up on their attitude as well. Because in verse number three, it says, for to their power... I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Paul knew these churches because he says there, I bear record. Paul started these churches. 
He was in their midst. He preached among them. He was there. And he says, um, I bear record that these people, uh, according to their power, even beyond their power, that they were willing of themselves. That word power means strength or ability. Paul knew, he knew the condition of these churches. He knew their poverty. He, he knew their affliction. But yet he said, according to their ability and beyond their ability, they were willing of themselves. We don't know how much these people gave, but thankfully God doesn't measure our giving by the amount. He measures it with the heart with which it is given. We've seen this principle elsewhere in God's word. I mean, we see, we see it in, in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. And we also see it in, in, in Luke 24, or 22, verse 1, the widow. Jesus is standing in the temple. He's watching all these guys give their money. And he, as he's watching, he sees this poor widow walk up, and she casts in two mites. Now, all these guys are blowing their trumpets. They're, 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 they're drawing attention to themselves, and they are laying it in there. They are giving of their abundance. But Jesus saw, watched that widow, and he, the Bible says he called his disciples over. He said, guys, did you see that? Did you just see what I just saw? And this is what, he, and this is what our Lord says. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in their, of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all of her living. Jesus said, guys, did you see what she just did? She gave of her power, yea, more than her power. She gave not only of her ability, but more of her ability. She gave everything she had. And Jesus said it added up to more than all those other things put together. You know, God, folks, God doesn't need our money. You know, you know Pastor Carl would come in every Sunday morning, look at Tristan and Matthew and say, hey, guys, did you put the bag of money out front? They say, yeah, and the same angel was guarding it that was guarding it last Sunday. Sweet, we've got everything covered for another week. God doesn't do that. He could, but he doesn't. He uses us to further his work. He uses us to give, and that's what he was doing here. He was, he was, these people were abounding in, their, in, in their, the amount of their generosity because they loved their Lord. And the, this, this uh, uh, widow did the exact same thing. They were willing of themselves, it tells us at the end of verse 3. If you ever wanted to, if you ever heard of free will giving, here it is. You can mark it down. This is free will giving. They didn't need to be coerced or pleaded with. They wanted to give. Paul talks about this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, just a few verses down below in verse 12. He says, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. God never expects us to give what we don't have. God expects us to give of what we do have according to what he's given us, how he's prospered us. The funny thing is, you know, we, we, we think, oh, free will giving. Oh, this is a new concept. Because what do we normally think of? When we think about giving, we automatically revert back to the Old Testament and go, ah, law, tithing, it's the law. Well, okay, it is. It was part of the law. You can read about it in Numbers chapter 18. It was the supply for the tribe of Levi because God told the tribe, you don't get any, any inheritance. You get no land. God says, I'm your inheritance. So they, uh, so they needed to be cared for. Cert of course God did that. Uh, you can also read it about it in Leviticus chapter 37 towards the end of the chapter in verses 30 through 33. But verse 34 of Leviticus 27 says, and all these commandments did God command Moses in, the, in Sinai. So they were commandments of God. God commanded these people to give. So that's arbitrarily what we need jerk to. We go back to the Old Testament, we think about tithing. But you know, Abraham and Jacob gave a tenth of, of, of what they owned hundreds of years before the law. In Genesis chapter 12, or chapter 14, 
God, uh, Abraham fights against the five kings, and, and he, gets, he gets the people back that they had taken, including his nephew Lot. And as he came back, he met up with Melchizedek. And Melchizedek says in verse 20, he blessed, uh, blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Hmm. So Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek, thanking God for the victory. I think God's given us a victory. Maybe we should give to thank God for the victory. Hmm. In Genesis 28, Jacob is, is, is sees the, the vision in heaven, and he, and, he, and he sets up the pillar, and he says, Lord, if you will protect me where I go, if you will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I can give back to my father, I will give you a tithe of it all. Hmm. So Jacob was going to give a tenth back to his Lord for his protection and provision. We get protection and provision today. Hmm. Well, that was outside the law. But free will giving is expressly talked about in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 25 through chapters 31, Moses is up on, on Sinai, and God explains to him what he is to do on how to build the tabernacle. He tells him, he gives him the whole set of blueprints. You know, the old, the old joke is that when Moses came down from the mount, he had the, ten, he had the tablets in one arm and a set of blueprints in the other. Because God told him exactly what to do, how to build the tabernacle. He gave him everything. All the, all, the, all the utensils, all the furniture, all the, the, the tabernacle itself, the size and what you cover it with, the outer court, the inner court, the holy of holies, everything, even the fence around, all the, all the, all the, all the, all the, the, the altar and the, and, the, and the brazen altar and the, and the, uh, the uh, uh, water. Um, yeah, you know. Huh? Yes, thank you, Laver. Gosh, it was bronze. You're supposed to look into it and be convicted, and I am too. <laughs> but God gave it all to him. And in those, in, in those chapters, he said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. But this is how God started Exodus chapter 25. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly, with his heart ye shall take my offering, and this is the offering which ye shall take of them. And God goes on to, to give him a rundown of everything to take an offering for. But God said, if they're willing to give. So in chapter 35, they start, they start building. They start, they start doing everything needed to uh, uh, build the tabernacle. And in, and, in, and in Exodus 35, verse 5, it says, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass, and he goes on. Down in verse 21 of Exodus 35, it says, And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing hearted and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold and every man that offered, uh, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. So everybody started giving. If their heart was willing, they brought it. As a matter of fact, in, in Exodus 36, verse 3, the Bible said that all the offerings were given to Moses, and Moses gave it to the men and the women to begin the work. But at the end of verse 3, it says, and they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. These people just kept on giving. Over and over, their free will offerings, they were giving to the work of the Lord. They wanted to see the place where God was going to reside with them built. They wanted to have the Lord with them. And they wanted to have a part in it, so they, they, they continued to give. But then, in Exodus chapter 36, verses 5 and 6, <clears throat> mark these down. Um, um, 
Yeah, in Exodus 36, 5 and 6. Mark these down because you'll probably never hear these words come out of a pulpit. I've been in churches for a long time, folks. I've never heard these words come from the pulpit. And they spake unto Moses, the men building, doing the building. The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work, which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from giving. You'll probably never hear that come from a church pulpit. But that's what God said. Mo these guys said, hey, Moses, you got to stop. We've got more than enough to, of what we need to build this tabernacle. And the Bible says the people refrain from giving. Hey, people, stop. Stop. That should give you a clue on, on how much they got when they left Egypt. But these people just kept on giving. They wanted to give. Some of the Macedonian churches, the, I'm sorry, it's the same with the Macedonian churches. They were willing to give. Paul didn't have to force them. He didn't beg them to give. As a matter of fact, it was the exact opposite. Look at verse number 4 of 2 Corinthians 8. Praying with us, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. That word pray there means to ask, desire, or beg. Entreaty means er, er, uh, earnestly or urgency. The gift, that's the same Greek word for grace. The fellowship means participating or sharing, and ministering means to serve or support. These people, the Bible says here that Paul said they begged us to take their gift. Now, maybe Paul, Paul we know that Paul knew their situation. Maybe Paul <clears throat> told them, hey, I know, I know how much you guys, how much affliction you're under. I know how deep your poverty is. You don't have to give this much. You don't have to. And these people were having none of that. They were saying, uh-uh, we understand God's grace. We want to have a part. We want to minister to the saints. We want to have a part in this. You can feel their joy and their excitement that they, were, that they had a part. They wanted to have a part. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall, shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God wants us to give with joy. He wants us to give because, he, that, because we want to have a part in what God's doing. We want to participate in it. We want to have a fellowship of the ministry. We want to, we want to give. And you could feel it here. These people wanted to give. They had a desire. They saw the need, and they had the opportunity, and they had the right attitude, and they wanted to give. But you might think about, okay, well, they had this affliction. They had this poverty. Sure, they had joy, but they had all this. Why would these people want to do this? Why would they want to have a part? Well, here's the key. This is, this is the key to the Macedonians and the way they give, and this is the key to the way we give. It's found in verse 5. In verse 5 says, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. The Macedonians did something Paul did not expect. In the light of their condition and needs, Paul seemed to be caught off guard with what they did. They gave themselves to the Lord first and then followed God's will to help. Folks, this is the key to giving. When you do what these, what these churches did, you'll understand that everything that we have comes from God. Not just what we give back, you know, we were talking about it in, in discipleship class today. And in Psalms chapter 50, verse 11, God says, do you think I would tell you if I was hungry? Why? Because I own the earth. 
fullness thereof. God says, this all belongs to me. But this is what, this is what these people did. They gave themselves to the Lord first. That's why I like to call first things first verses. You know, Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What all those things are, you can read back starting in verse 24 and read through and see what they are. God will take care of us. He says earlier in that chapter that God knows what we have need of before we even ask him. But God wants us to, to, to know what we're doing and understand the ramifications from this because in, in Matthew 6.21, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And folks, when you do what the Macedonian church did, when they gave themselves to the Lord first, boy, they synchronized their heart and their treasure. They said, okay, we, gave, we, gave, we give ourselves to the Lord first. Folks, God wants us before he wants a gift. He wants us before he wants any sacrifice. He wants us. And when the Macedonian church did this, they opened the door to everything. When they gave themselves to the Lord first, it opened the door to the opportunity and the desire to give. They could give with the proper attitude of joy in spite of their circumstances. They were receptive to God's will for the grace to help. As we'll talk about in a, in a moment, they had the proper motivation to give. When they gave themselves to the Lord first, everything else fell into place. They had a chance, the opportunity to meet the needs of other brothers and sisters in Christ, to further the Lord's work and giving themselves to their Lord enabled all of it. These people wanted the share and the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And like I said a minute ago, they, 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 do, giving themselves to the Lord gave them the proper motivation to give. Well, what was the motivation to give? Well, immediately it was the church in Jerusalem. These people needed help. And these, and these churches in Macedonia saw that need. But there were two other motivations that I took from this. And one of them is found in Romans chapter 15. Romans was <clears throat> written after 2 Corinthians. And in Romans chapter 15, Paul says this in Romans chapter 15. In verse 24, Paul says, when I go to Spain, I'm going to come and see you guys. I will stop there on my way to Spain. But in verse 25, he says, but now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Paul told the Romans that these people considered themselves spiritual debtors to the church in Jerusalem. Why? Because, folks, that's where it started. The church started in Jerusalem. We read in Acts chapter 2 about the, the, the blessings of God as the church began. 3,000 souls were saved. In Acts chapter 4, 5,000 souls were saved at least. So you have all these, all these people, the church beginning, the gospel being preached. And in Acts chapter 8, the Bible tells us that persecution forced the gospel out. It went elsewhere. And where was one of the places it went to? Right here. It went to Macedonia. It went to Achaia. That's where Corinth was. That's the southern part of Greece. So the Corinthians must have gotten word. They must have figured it out. They must have been blessed uh, and seen the opportunity to give because Paul says here in Romans uh, 15 they did. But they considered themselves spiritual debtors. They wanted the church in Jerusalem to be blessed. Uh, Jesus told his disciples in the Great Commission, he said, go in ye into all the world and teach all nations. Make disciples of all nations. You go and you go to the other, you go to, into all the world and preach the gospel. In Acts 1.8, he says, you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, here it is. This is part of the uttermost parts of the world. This is where the gospel was going. 
These people in Macedonia the church, uh, realized that the church in Jerusalem needed help. They knew the grace and the blessings that had come from the spreading of the gospel that started right there in Jerusalem, and they felt a duty to help with the material needs, what these people needed. They didn't say, hey, be warm and filled, brother. We'll pray for you. They said, no, these people need help, and we're going to help them. I put in parentheses by the duty, a labor of love. They loved their brothers and sisters in Christ, and they wanted to have a part. They wanted to help. But there's a bigger motivation than that. It's way more important than that. There's a bigger motivation than just seeing the need and wanting to have a part. You know, it says there that the church, the Macedonian churches gave themselves to the Lord first. And Paul is going to expound on that. He's going to give the Corinthians more detail to help them be encouraged. He wants them to be encouraged. He wants them to act like the churches in Macedonia and see God's rich blessing by his grace with the blessing and the, and the opportunity to give. And how does he expound on that? Well, he gives us two of the, 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 the two greatest examples of grace-filled free will giving. And the first one's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, in verses 8 and 9. For I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to, and to prove the sincerity of your love. He says, would you guys give? It will prove your, 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 that you actually love these people, that you want to have a part, you care about them. And who did he use as an example? Verse 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. Paul said that when we understand what our Lord Jesus Christ gave for us and to us, we should need no other motivation to give. We should need no other, other prompting to give back when we realize what Christ gave to us by his grace through his freely offering himself for us. So Paul told the Corinthians, one example is our Lord Jesus Christ. The other example is found at the end of chapter 9. In verse 14, And by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Paul told the Corinthians, you see what our Lord Jesus Christ gave up for you, what he gave for you? Think of God the Father, the grace of God that gave us the, the, the gift that cannot be explained. Your version may say indescribable. I, I like unspeakable because you go, let me explain the, the, the gift that God gave us. I got nothing. We will never fully understand the gift that God gave us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sin. God loved us so much, he knew we were in trouble. He knew we couldn't get out of what we were into. And he sent his son to take our place and pay the price for our sin. Paul said, hey, Corinthians, when you understand the grace of God that gave us an unspeakable gift in his son, and when you understand the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who came willingly and freely because he loved us, and he, though he was rich, he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might be rich, he goes, you don't need any other reason to give. You know, you hear people say, well, you can't outgive God. That's true. Most of the time they're talking about money. But that's not what I'm talking about. When we understand what God gave us, if you have Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, you look at those two verses and you understand what God offered to you for you to be saved, when you understand what our Lord Jesus Christ went through, that he might offer us salvation, Paul says you don't need any other motivation to give. 
Here it is. You can't outgive God. If God never gave you a dime in return for what you give to Him, you look at what we have coming and you say, okay, that's better. That's better. These people were able to give in Macedonia because they put their Lord in, the, in His rightful place first. And when you do that, you will, the giving, giving will be easy. You won't, hold my, you won't hold your gift like this, you'll hold your gift like this. Say, hey Lord, here it is. You know what I have need of. You know what, 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 I, what I need in my life to sustain me. You love me, I'm good. Take what you want. As I said earlier, God wants you before any gift. If you have Christ as your Savior, you know what that gift is. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. But if you're not saved, if you're in this room this morning and you don't know that, 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 that Jesus Christ is your Savior, if you have not accepted him, you need to know that the Son of God came for you. He came willingly for you. He came willingly for me, but he came willingly for you too. The penalty of sin had to be paid to satisfy a holy God. And we were stuck. But God said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ was the only one who could satisfy God's requirement for sin, and he did it for you if you don't have Christ as your Savior. He did it for all of us, but you need to understand what Christ gave for you. He left the glories of heaven and became poor. By becoming poor, I mean he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's what it means for Christ to be made poor. That through his poverty, we might be made rich. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God freely gave us the gift of eternal life, and he took our sin and put it on his son, and took the righteousness of his son and gave it to us. And when you realize that, you realize that you're a sinner, you have need of a Savior just like the rest of us. You say, I'm a sinner? I say, yes. Join the club. We all needed a Savior. But when you realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, you accept Him as your Savior. You can do it this morning, right now. You can, have, you can accept Christ as your Savior, and then you will be made rich as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this time together. Lord, I thank You for this passage that you've given us.